Hey, hi everyone. So today I'm trying a new format of short videos where I will give you a theorem and a proof of that theorem. Uh, hopefully I will cover topics in optimization, probability, machine learning. And today to start, I'm going to be talking about adversarial machine learning and more specifically randomized smoothing. So this uh, presentation is after a very nice paper of Corinne Rosenfeld and Coulter from 2019. Uh, this is where the theorem appeared, and I will explain the proof that we gave in our joint paper, Salman et al. Uh, from 2019. Okay, so what is the setting? Um, the setting is multi-class classification. So we have a function f from rd to, zero, to the cube 0, 1 to the k. So this function, it takes any input, say an image in d-dimensional space, and it returns the likelihood for each of the classes. So that's the point in 0, 1, 2, okay? From this likelihood function, you get a classifier, c of x, by just taking the most likely uh, class. So you take c of x is the argmax of fi of x, <clears throat> i in 1, 2, k. Now, in adversarial machine learning, we're not only interested in c being correct, but we also don't want uh, to have adversarial examples, meaning small perturbation of the input where suddenly the classifier outputs something different. Okay, so we're going to say that f is epsilon robust at the point x if the classification remains constant on a small ball around x, meaning that c of x plus delta is equal to c of x for any perturbation delta whose norm and all the norm will, will be Euclidean is smaller than epsilon. Okay, so that's our definition of being epsilon robust. And it's very easy to see that epsilon robustness is intimately related to Lipschitzness of that. More precisely, if f is L Lipschitz, <clears throat> then the following happen, then, we can say that uh, f is going to be robust, and how much robust? Then f is epsilon robust at x with epsilon, which is equal to the following, uh, one half of pa minus pb, where what are pa and pb? Where pa is the likelihood of the most likely outcome. So it's a maximum of fi of x. And pb is the second max. Let me be a, a bit casual here and just write second max. Fi of x. OK, so you have the most likely class, and you have the second most likely class. And what happens is that because your Lipschitz, when you make a little modification of, of size epsilon, then the value of the most likely class can drop by at most epsilon times L. <clears throat> and similarly, the second most likely class can only go up by uh, epsilon times L. So there should be a 1 over 2L here. Okay. So if epsilon is 1 over 2L PA minus PB, it cannot be that the most likely class becomes less likely than the second most likely class. Okay? So this is all uh, well and good. Now, neural networks are uh, infamously known to be very non Lipschitz. Okay, so that, that's a problem. Uh, so what two papers in 2018 proposed to do is to smoothen a network. Okay, so this were uh, Le Cuyer et al. from 2018 and Lee et al. from 2018. What they proposed is to smooth f. Okay. And in optimization, there is a very, and in many, many other fields of mathematics, there is a very well-known way to smooth a function, which is just to convolve with a Gaussian. Okay, so let me explain this. So the idea. So now we're going to fix f our neural network, and we're just going to consider right now just one, the likelihood of one uh, class. So f is a function from Rd01. And this function, we cannot assume any Lipschitz property about it. 
But what we're going to do is that we're going to look at the transform f hat of x. This is going to be a convolution with a Gaussian, meaning you take the expectation when you sample a Gaussian z, uh, let's say a standard Gaussian, identity covariance, of f of x plus sigma z. And sigma is some standard deviation that you can fix. Okay, this is our transform, right? So you smoothen a, a little bit the function. Now, in practice, you, you, you can do that with a neural network. What you do is that you, you have your image, and now you, do, uh, uh, you add uh, noise to it. You do it many, many times, and you look at the output that you get, and you just average all these outputs, and that gives you the new likelihood. Now, the thing is that it's very well known that f hat is Lipschitz. So, well known. And we're going to prove it. F hat is Lipschitz. And we're going to exactly see what is the, the constant. But the problem is, is going to be that this, when we say Lipschitz, we really mean it's, it has a uniform bound on the Lipschitz constant. But in practice, we really want to have local Lipschitzness. You know, certain images are just going to have adversarial examples. There is going to be a very small radius of robustness. So what we want to say is that for typical images, there is a very good Lipschitz constant, and maybe there are bad images where the Lipschitz constant is going to be bad. Okay. So what I'm going to do in this lecture is that I'm going to explain to you how to analyze the local Lipschitzness of FA. This is what I called in the in the title the nonlinear Lipschitzness. All right. So let's Let's go on and let's study now uh, the Lipschitz uh, constant of f hat and, and eventually the local Lipschitz constant. All right. So what is so to study the Lipschitz constant? What we need to do is we need to compute the gradient. Okay. So what is the gradient of f hat? Again, f hat. You can write it as the convolution of f with the Gaussian density um, whose standard deviation is sigma. So let's call it gamma sigma where gamma sigma uh, of x is just equal, this is just the density of the Gaussian, 1 over 2 pi, um, sorry, 2 pi sigma squared to the d over 2 exponential minus the norm of x squared over 2 sigma squared. Right, this is the density of the Gaussian. So now, when I want to take the gradient of this, grad, grad f hat, as you all know from the formula of the uh, derivative of a convolution, this is just f convolved with the gradient of gamma sigma. Now, what is the gradient of gamma sigma? Gradient of gamma sigma of x, you see, when I differentiate uh, this uh, density, I, I have the exponential and I just differentiate what's inside the exponential. So the norm of x squared differentiated, the gradient of that is just x. So what I get is just, I mean, it's 2x. Uh, so what I get is just x over sigma squared, let's say with a minus sign, uh, times uh, gamma sigma of x. Okay, so in other words, grad f hat. It's again the convolution, so grad f hat at x. It is simply, you see, I, the convolution is just I have this factor x, but then I integrate with respect to the density of the Gaussian. So this is just the expectation when z is sampled, let's say, from a uh, standard Gaussian. Uh, let's say, sorry, yeah, let's say sample from a standard Gaussian. I get uh, minus z over sigma squared, uh, z over sigma, because I took it to be a standard Gaussian, times f of little x plus sigma z. OK, so z, this is an important formula. This is simply the formula of the derivative. And this is what we're going to study from now on. Okay, everything that you want to know about random randomized smoothing is basically in the gradient of uh, the randomized smooth version. Of it. And and to recall what we're trying to do, we want to understand Lipschitzness because that will give us a radius of uh, robustness, right? If you remember, just up there, 
what we showed is that you're epsilon robust at x, uh, where epsilon is just one of the two, two times the Lipschitz constant times PA minus PB, where PA is the likelihood of the most likely class and PB is the second most likely class. Okay, very good. So now we just want to study the gradient of F hat. Um, so we, we need to, you know, if we, if we want to uh, have a uniform bound, we just need to compute the norm of the gradient. Well, it's going to be very simple. You see the norm of the gradient. I can just apply the triangle inequality. And this is upper bounded by, I mean, this is equal to the norm of what's above. So it's upper bounded by the expectation of the norm. Sorry, what right here? Uh, okay. Okay, it doesn't want to do what I want, but that's okay. Uh, it's upper bounded by the expectation of the norm of z over sigma f of x plus sigma z. Now we know that f is um, that f is a likelihood, so it's between zero and one. So this is certainly bounded by one over sigma, the expectation of the norm of z. Now z is a standard Gaussian, so the expectation of the norm of z is of order square root of the dimension. A uh, very simple way to do it is just to apply Jensen inequality. So you get one over sigma square root of the expectation of the norm of z squared. And the expectation of the norm of z squared by definition of sigma squared, um, by definition, sorry, of the standard deviation, this is one in every coordinate. So I get d in this expectation of the norm of z squared. This is equal to square root d over sigma. And in fact, we didn't lose anything in the Jensen inequality. It's very easy to actually write an, an exact quantity and you just win a, a 1 over square root 2 pi, just some constant if you don't do Jensen here. OK, uh, so this is good. We see that if we pick sigma to be large, OK, so if we do a, a large randomized smoothing, uh, then we're going to have a very smooth function. But on the other end, we have a square root d, okay? So we have a dimension-dependent constant, so that's not very good. But you can do much better, and here is how you can do much better. What is the norm? Norm of grad f at, so this is now a better bound. So the norm of grad f hat of x, this is just the supremum over all unit vector u, such that the norm of u is equal to 1 of the inner product u dot grad f hat of x. OK, so now let's write it in our formula. So this is the supremum over u of the expectation of the inner product z dot u over sigma times f of x plus sigma z. But now we're in much better shape because you see z dot u is one dimensional. So it's a one z dot u is a one dimensional Gaussian with variance uh, one. So we can do the exact same inequality and we're just going to get that this is bounded by one over sigma. Okay, so the uniform Lipschitz constant uh, of the randomized uh, smoothing f hat is one over sigma. Okay, so there is no dimension dependent. Very good. You can already take that and get some radius of robustness for randomized smoothing. But in fact, you can do much better. And this is what the Cohen et al. Uh, paper did. They noticed that there is a certain nonlinear Lipschitzness of randomized smoothing. So let's see what is this nonlinear Lipschitzness. Okay, so now, uh, nonlinear Lipschitzness. Or I should say, it's really local Lipschitzness. OK. So let's see, where, where did we lose? The only place where we lose is when we apply this inequality here. OK. And what is this inequality? It's just bounding the likelihood by 1 everywhere. But what happens if the function is 1 you know, everywhere around you, then it means that you know, the, the function is constant. So f hat is very, very Lipschitz. So let's, let's be a bit more concrete. Let's say we have this function. So this is a region where f is 1. OK, so over here, 
f is equal to 1, let's say, and over here, f is equal to 0. Okay, so it's a very, very non Lipschitz function. Now, what does randomized smoothing do? So let's say we have a point here, x. Randomized smoothing, it takes a Gaussian density and it looks around it, you know, and it does an average in this ball. Very good. But now you see that if we are up over there, then basically we stay constant over here. Right? So the Lipschitz constant at a point x like this is going to be much better than over here where we are you know, navigating uh, in the nonlinearity of the function f. So to put it differently, if we're in a region which is far away from the boundary, from boundaries of f, then it should be that the local Lipschitz constant is very, very good. Now, what, the, what does the boundary mean? The boundary is exactly our PA minus PB of before. You see, when, when I'm in this region here, this is a region where we're not sure if the output should be 1 or 0. So over here, PA and PB in the randomized smooth version are going to be very close to each other, whereas in this region here, we know that the likelihood of 0 is very, very high. Okay, so we're going to have a bound now on the norm of the gradient, which depends on this PA minus PB. That's what we're going to try to do. Okay, so let's, let's do it. So again, what we're trying to do is um, we're trying to compute the expectation of the inner product Z dot U for unit norm direction U over sigma times F of X plus sigma. And what we're going to do, you know, our intuition now is to look at the shape of f, the shape of the function f. So let's see how bad can this be, provided that we have a certain likelihood. So let's take the supremum of this quantity over all function f from Rd to 0, 1, such that the expectation of f of x plus sigma z is equal to some p. Okay, so let's say our likelihood is p. Okay, so this is what, what is the value of our randomized smoothing at the point x. Now let's see, given this constraint, given that we know that at the point x, the randomized smoothing gives us a value p, what is the worst case for the Lipschitz constant? So if you just look at this optimization problem, it looks like an infinite dimensional optimization problem, and maybe we're, we're in trouble. Okay? But let me show you that we're not in trouble at all. So let's just rewrite this as, you know, just change the notation. This is a supremum of a whole uh, measure, let's say mu, um, mu from Rd to 0, 1. Such that the expectation, so it's a, it's not a measure uh, of of total measure one, but it's a measure of total measure p. And this is a, it's a reweighting of the Gaussian density of the expectation. You know, we have this one over sigma, and then we have the expectation of z dot u times mu of z. Okay, so we're just doing a reweighting of the Gaussian density so as to maximize this thing. Now, let me show you what's happening. So, this is a direction u. Okay. And let's say, so you see, as I want to maximize the inner product z dot u, you know, z dot u is maximized over here, you know, in very far in that direction, in the direction of u. So, the reweighting mu intuitively it should put all of its mass you know over there towards um, in the direction u so let me claim that in any ball here okay the mass should be zero the mass under mu should be zero and where is this line this line over here this hyperplane is so that um, you know Let's let's write let's look at this direction u. So this is zero. And this point here is the inverse CDF of, of the Gaussian density at P. Meaning that if you have a standard Gaussian, the probability that you know you're larger than this threshold is exactly equal to P. 
Okay, so the total mass in this half space is exactly p. All right, so that's 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 the key point. Now I'm I am saying that if mu, if the measure mu in this supremum, let's assume by contradiction that it puts some epsilon mass on a small ball around uh, uh, outside of this half space. So this means that there exists, since the total measure of mu is p, in this half space which has total measure p, there must be some set, I don't know, maybe it's a very complicated set, uh, which has measure, you know, uh, um, which is empty, basically. So what I can do is now I can transfer the mass of this little ball in these regions. And I'm only going to improve the expectation of z dot u integrated against the weight mu of z, right? All of this mass here that I had under mu, you know, it was contributed in, in my integral to z dot u for some ba small value of z dot u, and now it's contributing to a much larger value of z dot u. So I just proved to you that there cannot be any mass under mu which is outside uh, of this half space over here. So now we know the value of this integral, this supremum, is exactly equal, now the supremum is exactly equal to the expectation of z dot, so there is a one over sigma, of z dot u indicator that z dot u is larger than phi minus one of p. Right, and we can exactly calculate what is this value. So z dot u, um, z dot u is a one-dimensional Gaussian. So this is equal to one over sigma, and then I have one over square root two pi, the integral of t, and the integral is from phi minus one of p to infinity. And I have the integral of t times e to the minus t squared over 2 dt. So, you know, this, the, the uh, antiderivative is just minus e to the minus t squared over 2. So the value of this is exactly equal to 1 over sigma, 1 over square root 2 pi, e to the minus phi minus 1 of p squared over 2. So that quantity over here, this is a local Lipschitz constant. You see, if p goes to, let's say, 1, okay, meaning that we're very sure our likelihood at this point is very, very close to 1, so we're almost sure of what is the right class, or, or so it seems. So this means that phi minus 1 of p is going to infinity, right? To have a threshold close to 1, you need to go to infinity in the Gaussian density. So e to the minus phi minus 1 of p squared, this is going to go to 0. So it is extremely Lipschitz. If you are at a point x where randomized smoothing gives you a likelihood close to 1, it is very, very Lipschitz. The radius of robustness is going to be very, very large. Okay. Now, uh, there is a slightly nicer way to express all of this, which, which I'm going to do now. Um, so, a nice way to express local Lipschitzness, so a nice way to express local Lipschitz, is to say that, in fact, f hat composed with a certain very non Lipschitz function remains Lipschitz. So, let's say psi of f hat of x is Lipschitz for some non-Lipschitz psi, for some non-Lipschitz psi. So if psi of f hat of x is Lipschitz despite psi being non-Lipschitz, it means that f hat is very Lipschitz in a way. So let's see what, what I mean by that. Well, the gradient of psi of f hat of x, this is nothing but uh, grad f hat of x 
times psi prime of f hat of x. Okay, and remember that our p over there was exactly equal to f hat of x. That's our definition. So you see, if psi of f hat of x is Lipschitz, then it just means that grad f hat is uh, smaller than 1 over psi prime of, of uh, p. Okay, so good. Um, so now, what did we show? We showed that this, so norm of grad psi of f hat of x by our computation over there it's more than 1 over sigma 1 over square root 2 pi e to the minus pi minus 1 of p squared there is a 1 half times uh, psi prime of p right so now if we want this to be Lipschitz, let's say 1 over sigma Lipschitz to respect what we had before, we would like, so take psi prime of p, which is equal to the inverse of this. So 1 over 1 over square root 2 pi e to the minus 1 half of phi minus 1 of p squared. Now notice what is Remember, what is phi of p or phi of, of t? Uh, let me try to erase. OK, of course, it doesn't want. So phi of t, this is the 1 over square root 2 pi, the integral from t to infinity of e to the minus x squared over 2 dt. Right? So phi prime of t. Uh, this is minus 1 over square root 2 pi e to the minus t squared over 2. So psi prime, you know, is exactly minus, or let's say, let's take psi prime to be equal to minus this because we have an absolute value so we can do what we want. So this is exactly 1 over phi prime of phi minus 1 of p which is nothing but the formula of phi minus 1 prime of p. Okay, so we just showed that if you take psi to be phi minus 1, then psi f hat is Lipschitz. So here is the theorem that we proved. Theorem. Phi minus 1 of f hat. Okay, the map x from phi minus 1 to f hat is 1 over sigma Lipschitz. Okay, so this is a very nice uh, theorem. Remember, just to, to be clear, what is phi minus 1? Phi minus 1 is this function, right? Okay, this is 0 and this is 1. So you see towards when f hat of x is close to 0 or close to 1, meaning the likelihood, we're almost sure either it's the right class or it's not the right class, then phi minus 1, the, the derivative is very, very large. So if phi minus 1 of f hat is Lipschitz, it means that when f hat is close to 0 or close to 1, f hat must vary very, very slowly. Okay, so it's very, very Lipschitz. So let's see concretely how to use uh, this theorem in the multi-class classification problem. So now we have our two classes most likely, let's say the most likely class is A, the second most likely class is B. They have value PA and PB for their likelihood. So we know that F hat, let's say, uh, of A at X, this is PA, and it's larger than F hat of B at X, which is equal to PB. Okay, so we have PA and PB, these are our uh, two most likely classes. So then what happens? Then if we do f hat of a of x plus delta minus f hat, uh, sorry, and let's apply phi minus 1. Phi minus 1 minus phi minus 1 of f hat b at x plus delta. 
then we know by Lipschitzness, since this is one of a uh, sigma Lipschitz, and the norm of delta, remember, is less than epsilon, then we know that by moving by delta, we can move by at most um, epsilon over sigma. Okay, so this is bigger than phi minus 1 of Pa minus phi minus 1 of Pb minus uh, 2 epsilon over sigma right because phi minus 1 of f hat of x can vary by at most epsilon over sigma and the same thing for phi minus 1 of f hat of b so this is non negative if epsilon is smaller than sigma over 2 phi minus 1 of pa minus phi minus 1 of pb and what does it mean that it's non negative if it's non negative you know that implies that f hat a of x plus delta is larger than f hat b of x plus delta this is because uh, phi minus 1 is uh, non increasing meaning that the classification c hat uh, at x plus delta is equal to the classification at x meaning that f is f hat is epsilon robust at x okay so this is the end result we get this radius of robustness okay so f hat is epsilon robust the randomized smoothing of any neural network is epsilon robust at any point x where epsilon is given by this formula sigma over 2 phi minus 1 of pa minus phi minus 1 of pb and again i want to emphasize what's nice about this is that if the likelihood pa let's say goes to 1 then phi minus 1 of pa goes to plus infinity meaning that you get a very very large radius of robustness so this little uh, theorem that i just gave you gives you the state of the art uh, radius of robustness for adversarial examples and it is a, a fantastic open problem uh, to go beyond what was discussed here. Okay, so I think that's it for today. Thank you very much.